Happy Halloween, Michael. You know, it's Halloween. Everyone's entitled to one good scare. So we meet this girl, Lori Strode, whose dad is so lazy, he's having her drop off the keys to a house he's selling. On the way there, she bumps into Tommy, the little kid she's supposed to babysit tonight, and we find out it's the local murder house. See, back in 1963, this couple came home Halloween night and found their six-year-old son, Michael, practically catatonic and holding a bloody knife. He can't speak. He just chooses not to. Someone had stabbed their daughter while she was naked and just had sex. So instead of assuming the guy she just banged killed her, and that her little brother just witnessed something horrific, they blame the six-year-old for the murder and throw him in the nut house. You blame everything on kids. Boys who keep secrets don't get custard for dessert. Now all the kids in town are afraid of this house and dare each other to go in. So Tommy doesn't want Lori to go up there, but she promised she would put the key under the mat because someone's going to tour the house at 10.30. Be sure to leave it under the mat. Promise! But when she places the key, we see that there's somebody inside watching her. Michael escaped the nut house last night, and his psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis, is freaking out because he thinks Michael is pure evil. But he got away by playing I Got Your Nose and pulling some hair, so I'm not sure where Dr. Loomis is getting the pure evil from. Well, he was probably really violent in the nut house. No, he was actually really well behaved, didn't bother anyone, and never caused a scene. I watched him for 15 years, sitting in a room, staring at a wall. Is that what bothers you? But he gets upset that nobody's taking the escape seriously, but everyone else is like, he can't speak and has a kindergarten education. This isn't that big of a deal. He's a six-year-old boy with the strength of a man and the mind of an animal. But they ignore the fact that he was able to drive a car and might have picked up a few other things. And he's become the most captivating bird whistler. So Loomis goes to Haddonfield himself to warn him, but on the way, finds a truck that Michael must have run off the road, but for some reason, doesn't find the body that's just a few feet away. So he really is a killer? Of course. It wouldn't be a very scary story if he wasn't, but there's absolutely no reason for these characters to be sure about it. Because I know him. I'm his doctor. So the people that want to buy his house are going to die? No. When they were looking at the house, Michael was staring at Lori in class, but I'm not sure how he was able to find her once she got in the school. But the walkthrough of those potential buyers must have been a little weird. There's a dead dog in here. But at least they weren't murdered for going in Michael's house, because he's out stalking not only Lori, but Tommy too. Leave me alone! Tommy gets picked on by the only kids in school that don't celebrate Halloween. I used to bust this guy's balls. This kid Lonnie and his friends make Tommy smash his pumpkin, that I guess was given to him at school because he sure as shit didn't have that earlier. You gotta share your shit, Lonnie. So while Michael's following Tommy, Lori's walking home with Linda, and their friend Annie runs up to join him. On the way home, Lori sees Michael a few more times. They had sightings of a, a ghost-like figure creeping right through our town. But Annie doesn't take her seriously. He wants to take you out tonight. She's not actually wrong, it's just not the way she means. Poor Lori, scared another one away. She even yells at Michael as he drives by, and he doesn't seem to like this. That was a mistake. But after Annie goes home, she bumps into Annie's dad, who's a sheriff, and she stupidly doesn't tell him that there might be a creep staring in your daughter's window. And like, there's a creepy man in a white mask, and he keeps like, trying to play hide and seek with us. But when she goes home, she sees Michael staring in her window, playing peekaboo. And he pops out like, peekaboo, I mean, we're not three years old. And then Annie calls the person she was just with to say that she'll pick her up at 6.30. But Tommy lives close enough that she was walking him to school. Why would she need a ride? Okay, well, it is a school night, so we're not gonna kazam too much. Oh. So Dr. Loomis finally gets to Haddonfield and goes to Judith Meyer's grave, where someone apparently lifted the 230-pound headstone straight out of its hole. Or was it more than a man? So the girls are still driving around, and they've smoked so much weed at this point that they don't even notice Michael following them around. But then Annie sees her dad outside of the hardware store and decides to pull over to talk to him. Well, apparently somebody broke into the open hardware store and stole a mask, some rope, and some knives. So we're supposed to think it's Michael, but he had the mask way earlier when she was in school. I don't know. Maybe they suck at their jobs and it took them nine hours to respond to the call. I mean, we are talking about a sheriff who can't smell the weed in his daughter's car. I think he knew. I'm sure he could smell it. Could have been a skunk. But then Dr. Loomis shows up to talk to Sheriff Brackett, and while he's waiting on him, misses his own car drive-by. You ever done anything like this before? So apparently the girls keep driving around for a few more hours until it gets dark. They then go to their respected kids' houses to babysit the only kids in town that don't trick-or-treat. I babysit some fucking loser kids. So Sheriff Brackett and Dr. Loomis get to the Myers house, where they discover a dead dog that either Michael or a skunk ate. He got hungry. 
Could have been a skunk. Could have. A skunk? Yeah, apparently skunks break into houses, lure dogs in, and then eat them. It's very common in the Midwest. You know, every town is something like this happens. They go up to Judah Soul's room, and at the exact moment they're staring by the window, a gutter swings down and breaks it. What are the chances of that? Astronomical. But it needed to happen to give us a jump scare and establish that Dr. Loomis has a gun. Put down that gun. Put down the gun! Well, Dr. Loomis wants to stay around and see if Michael shows up, but he tells Sheriff Brackett not to let anyone in town know that there's an escaped lunatic on the loose. Why? Well, he must think that Haddonfield is full of violent idiots that will go nuts and try to kill innocent people if they found out. Sheriff Brackett takes his advice, even though he would much rather warn everyone so they could take precautions. I still think I should notify the radio and television. No. But I don't think you get that much panic when the person who escaped hasn't done anything wrong. At least to anyone's knowledge, in the last 15 years. Michael Myers loose in Haddonfield on Halloween night? We wanna have a fucking circus on our hands. But you would think he would at least warn his daughter. And he's having problems with Lindsay's dog, who's barking at the kitchen door. And instead of looking out the window to see what he's barking at, she gets Lindsay to put him outside. Get this dog out of the kitchen right now! And when Tommy looks out the window, we can see that the dog's going crazy because Michael's in their yard. He tells Lori, and despite the fact that she thinks someone has been following her around all day, and knowing that the Wallace's dog was just freaking out about something, I'm about to be ripped apart by the family dog. She blows him off because Annie told a boy she likes him. <laughs> But then Annie spills a small dab of butter on her shirt, so she has to strip and go do laundry. But before she goes out, Lester goes after Michael, and he dies. Yeah, butthole. And Annie's a butthole too. Yeah, she had the family dog outside in a yard that isn't fenced in on a day known for people playing mean pranks. We got you good! And she pays no attention even when she hears it whimper. Never mind. So the Wallaces are gonna be pissed. You suck at babysitting. You asshole. She even has to go out to the Wallace's shed to do her laundry, has the door shut and lock itself, gets stuck in a window where Lindsay has to come to help her, and neither one of them notice the dog is gone. What the fuck? Well, they have more important things to do since Paul calls and tells Andy to come get him and Lindsay can watch movies with Tommy. Couldn't let you have all the fun. So, so Andy takes Lindsay over to Tommy's house, again, not caring where the Wallace's dog is, and is all, Lori, you're doing my job tonight. And in exchange for this, Andy's going to tell the boy that Lori likes, who agreed to go out with her on a date tomorrow night, that Lori actually doesn't like him if she watches the kid. What? Seriously, don't try to understand it. Teenagers are stupid. Hey, is it cool if you guys have I explode one of these pumpkin heads? <laughs> yeah, oh, right. But Michael was watching this the whole time. So when Annie's locked car door reminds her that she needs keys to drive, she goes back into the house. He takes the opportunity to utilize his Grand Theft Auto skills that they taught him at Smith's Grove and sneakily breaks in and hides in the back seat. Michael Myers is in the back seat. Go look. Go look. Go look. Oh no. And when she gets back, she doesn't notice that Michael stupidly left the door unlocked, but she does know that the windshield's fogged up from someone being in it for a minute when the car was in the garage and weather that she's running around in her underwear in. Oh, is this one of your cheap trips? You fucking kidding me? But before she realizes she should get the hell out of there, Michael pops up and strangles her. Guess not. Why well, bet she wished she'd listen to the dog now. Oh, shut up, jerk. I'm never smiling again. Tommy sees that giant dude again, this time carrying a body that looks freaking tiny compared to him. And he reacts in a way that Lindsay will never find him attractive ever in the future. And Lori, once again, blows him off. Not even trying to figure out what he really saw. Tommy, stop it! Now there's nobody out there! And if she had just taken a second, he might have said, I saw a giant man carrying a body that looked a lot like Annie into Lindsay's house. And considering they're in a quiet neighborhood, they should have heard Annie honking the horn as she died. Lori really should be taking this more seriously. And speaking of people not taking things seriously, Annie's dad, the sheriff, meets back up with Loomis and is all, are you sure there's a psycho on the loose? Because I would really like to go home now. And Loomis is like, yes, I'm sure. You don't understand. This guy stared at a wall for years. That has got to mean he wants to kill people and there's no other possible explanation. But he is killing people. 
and dogs. But remember, Loomis has no way of knowing for sure that Michael killed anybody. You blame everything on kids. Judith could have been killed by her boyfriend, who left seconds before she was murdered. I can't believe they let you off. And he didn't see the body by the truck, so unless he's psychic, none of this makes sense. He knew a killer when he saw one. And if they did tell people, Lonnie and his friends might have not shown up at Michael's, daring him to go inside. And I guess Loomis knows he sucks as a lookout, because he seems scared that Lonnie might actually do it. So he scares him away. But he still doesn't want Sheriff Brackett telling anybody, so they're staying with their previous plan of Loomis staking out the house, and Brackett driving around aimlessly, hoping to just run into him. But he's still at the Wallace's house where Linda and Bob show up and think that nobody's home. So they decide to go upstairs where there's a lit jack-o'-lantern next to the bed, just in case we forgot it was Halloween. And after this teenage boy overcomes erectile dysfunction, can't help it, the phone keeps ringing. He gives Linda the best 30 seconds of her life. This is going nowhere. And he figures if he gets her drunk enough, she'll forget about his crap performance. At least he lasted longer than Judith's boyfriend. Totally. And then Bob goes downstairs to steal some beers from Lindsay's parents, and Michael doesn't like this, so he stabs Bob, and he dies. And it might seem that Bob wanted to die because he doesn't put up much of a fight. I'm gonna go down swinging. Well, Michael pins him to the wall, and it looks like he grabbed the biggest, longest, sharpest knife that the hardware store had to offer because it not only goes through Bob, but also the door with plenty of room to spare. He then dresses up like a ghost to go kill Linda. <laughs> Take off that thing. Well, Linda calls Lori, and while she's being killed, it kind of sounds like she's into it. Oh, this is totally silly. Don't rip my blouse. Everybody's having a good time tonight. So after several hours of standing by a bush, Dr. Loomis finally turns around and sees his car parked across the street. But I'm not sure how he didn't notice it earlier since he was facing it when he was talking to the sheriff. So unless Michael was going to stroll up to the door like that idiot Lonnie and his friends did earlier, which Loomis got way too much entertainment out of scaring, Loomis would have totally missed him and he could have just snuck up and stabbed him. You must be ready for him. Well, since the kids are asleep, Lori decides to go across the street where she thinks all of her friends are all... And that's all you ever think about. When she can't get in the front door, she walks around the back, where apparently a skunk dragged off the dog's dead body, and when she goes in the back door, either Bob didn't bleed when he got stabbed, or Michael mopped it up. You did something messy. She looks around for him downstairs, and when she doesn't find him, even though she thinks they might all be naked, she goes upstairs to check the bedrooms. Are you fooling around again? Well, she finds Annie posed with his sister's tombstone. And are you alright? It's not been my night. And then he rigged Bob's body to swing from the ceiling. Bob? Cute Bob, real cute. And made a door open to reveal Linda stuffed in a closet. Linda? Hi Lori, what's up? Later. I mean, are we supposed to believe that Michael's like under the bed pulling some strings or something? I'm not really sure how all this works. What difference does it make? It makes a big difference. And since it hasn't been that long since she's talked to Linda, she should be worried that the killer's nearby. So does she run from the house screaming? Help! Oh God, help me! Or call the cops? No. She sits with her back to an open door. You guys think I'm too smart. But Michael's nice enough to wait for her to start moving before he tries to stab her. So he only grazes her arm. But this causes her to pull fold over the railing and hurt her leg. Michael comes after her, so she forgets how doors work and has to run to the kitchen, which for some reason has a lock to keep people in the house out. I guess they're worried Lindsay's gonna get fat or something? Let's make more popcorn. No, we've had enough. But she locks that door, only to find the door she came in through wedged shut with a rake. Now I'm not sure how Michael had the time to do this, while also pulling all those strings and managing not to be panning heavily when hiding from Lori. Smith's Grove must have a great phys ed department. Our patients get proper exercise. Even though the rake is clearly blocking the door, she keeps turning the knob, hoping it will magically open. But then Michael punches a hole through the door like it's paper mache to turn the knob, and she's like, oh, that's a good idea, and breaks the glass. You know, I was in the honor society too. She gets out just in time to run to the neighbors who are not in the mood for this shit. Halloween's over, kids! So instead of screaming call the cops, or breaking their window so they will call the cops, she hobbles back to the Doyles, leading the killer, who has already killed minors, to two children who are defenseless in bed. I'm not about to let anything happen to you. When she gets there, the psycho is again able to get really close because opening doors is hard. But this time, it's because she can't get the keys out of her ridiculously tight 70s pants and Tommy not giving a crap that she's screaming hurry at the top of her lungs. Speed kills! 
Buddy gets her in, where she sends Tommy upstairs and immediately goes to call the cops. But Michael's cut the phone line. Well, how did he do that when he was just behind her? Well, I mean, who says he just did it? Last time we know the phone was working was when he killed Linda. So he cleaned up, set up the bodies, went across the street where he already knew Lori was with two kids, cut the line when Lori went across the street. He thought, perfect, and ran back. Locked the door when Lori went through, snuck in the locked house, ran upstairs before she could get there, made sure she found all the bodies, and attacked her all without getting winded. Pretty simple. Don't underestimate it. But as she finds out the phone isn't working, Michael climbs in the open window that I guess he opened at the same time he cut the phone line. So figuring out that the killer's in the room with her, she sits on the ground and goes for a secret weapon, a knitting needle, that this teenage girl apparently takes with her wherever she goes. As usual, I have nothing to do. But this dumbassery surprisingly works, and she stabs Michael. <laughs> Since he falls down, she naturally assumes he's dead, puts down his weapon, and goes upstairs to tell the kids that everything's okay. But they see him once he makes it all the way up the stairs, and of course, he has the knife that Lori was nice enough to leave for him. So Lori locks the kids in one of the bedrooms, hoping that Michael will either follow her into another one, or that she can get away while Michael kills the kids. That's against the rules, I'm telling my mom. She chickens out jumping off the balcony, and instead hides in a closet, thinking that the solid structure of the door will protect her. While Michael isn't fooled by the open door, probably because he knows Lori's legs hurt, and he immediately starts yanking on the door that she tied closed. But it takes him longer to break through this flimsy slotted closet door than it did a solid kitchen door, so Lori has enough time to make a makeshift weapon out of a hanger, even after she spent most of her time he was breaking in, cowering in fear. We always fight! She stabs him in the eye with a hanger, which gets him to back off for a second, so she stupidly drops her weapon, but luckily, he dropped his knife, so when he comes back, she stabs him, and he drops again. But this time, she's smart enough to keep his weapon. Nope, take that one back. She's still stupid. You secretly hope Michael comes back for you. She goes to the kids and tells them to go get help, while she sits with her back to the man who has already survived one of her stabbings that she thought killed him. You can't kill the boogeyman. So of course, he gets back up and strangles her. Most definitely stop being funny, now cut it out! But while this is happening, Sheriff Brackett catches up with Loomis on the street that his daughter and her friends were murdered on, and Lori is currently being attacked on, and they're all like, nothing is happening. Simple town where nothing exciting ever happens. But Loomis tells him he found his car three blocks away, meaning that Michael carried that 230 pound headstone three blocks without anybody noticing who had a power beyond any mortal man but bracket drives off to check the alleys while loomis walks along the street luckily the kids run out screaming so loomis sees where they came from he runs inside and sees michael attacking lori he shoots him a few times and he falls off the balcony and when he goes to check on him you see he's gone you mean he just disappeared where'd he go i don't know maybe a skunk came by and dragged him off as a matter of fact it was. So Loomis calls it in, and this rookie Frank Hawkins shows up and follows Michael through the alley. But Michael magically goes through a fence to get away. He vanished. Backup shows up, so they split into two teams, with Hawkins and his partner heading north towards Michael's house. Hawkins' partner, Pete McCabe, used to play with Michael. But he would just spend the whole time staring out of his sister's bedroom window. Which is funny, because when he first saw Lori, he was staring out the front door. And after he killed Judith, he stood out in front. But I don't know why he would do that if his obsession was the window. Who knows what motivates him? At the same time, other officers are driving around looking for him and warning anyone else to get inside. Back in your houses now! But one of them finds Lonnie, who's being bullied by the Mulaney's, but he probably deserves it. Ray. Remember the one time Lonnie punched that cop in the face? Ray. The cop's nice enough to warn them about the knife-wielding psycho in a white mask. So the other kids all walk home together, but Lonnie thinks that the best route to go home on his own is right past the house he was just scared away from. So while he's running home, Lonnie falls flat on his ass. And for somebody who is so freaked out that they weren't looking where they were going, he takes a really long time to get up. I mean, he lays there long enough for Michael to slowly shuffle up on him. Lonnie Lamb probably won't get out of the sixth grade. So he doesn't kill him because it would be way too easy and kind of pathetic. Happy to check and shit. But Officer Hawkins and his partner see him, and now he can run again. And they realize that Michael went back home. And because this is before all the cop dramas were on TV, they have no idea how to clear a house. Oh, shoot! There's a dead dog in here. Could have been a skunk. Could have. This one cop even goes past an open door without checking it to look out the window. The same window he said Michael always stared out. He then sees footprints confirming his suspicion and does nothing. Do you know what happens to people? who come into the Myers home without an invitation. Michael pops out and kills him. But then Frank comes in and shoots Pete. Jesus, Frank. So Michael just leaves because I guess he's scared of guns, but I don't know why he would be. I mean, Loomis shot him six times and he doesn't seem to be injured at all. 
but at least a bunch of other cops just showed up as backup. But since they have him outnumbered and have guns, he just gives up without a fight. So the rookie cop lies to the other guy and tells him that he killed Michael, so at least he's happy before he dies. Then he immediately goes downstairs and stops Loomis from killing the guy he just swore to someone on their deathbed that he had killed. This is not how it works. It is tonight. So they put him back in the loony bin, and after 40 years, he does nothing. Dr. Loomis dies, and one of his students, Dr. Sartain, takes over Michael's care. And he's not happy they're transferring him to a crappier hospital. But you have to wonder why they would stupidly transfer the man who has killed people on Halloween on two separate occasions, the night before Halloween. I've worked with Michael for years. I've never seen him in an uncontrolled environment. It was his obsession, not Michael's. And these reporters are at the loony bin trying to interview Michael, even though he doesn't talk. Say something, Michael. I bet he will look really scary on their show. Well, it would, but they're podcasters, which means that they're only getting the audio of how he reacts to his William Shatner mask. Say something! He pulls it out, and all the patients go crazy. Well, more than they already are. But they get no reaction out of him. So now they're going to track down Lori. Well, she lives in a mini fort in the woods because she's afraid Michael will come back. But she's still right outside of the town that she almost got murdered in. Why not leave? Why stay? Maybe she's agoraphobic. They bribe her to talk to him, and then they tell her that he's being transferred, and that today would be the last opportunity she would have to try to get him to talk. While well, they record it, so they can make money. Maybe they should have asked her to do this before they asked her what it was like being a bad mother. What the hell do you do that for? Then we meet Lori's family. Her granddaughter, Allison, is going to introduce her parents to her boyfriend, Cameron, that her father, Ray, doesn't approve of since his family's scummy. True yeah. balls out in the Dad woods, man. Is that? It was and she asks her mom, Karen, to make sure that Lori can make it to the dinner. But she doesn't want to see her mom because she's a drunk nutbag. So she lies and says she can't make it, which Allison knows is bullshit. It's bullshit. Allison's friends want to know about Lori and are very empathetic to her being a shut-in. All things considered, there's a lot worse stuff that's happening today. She goes to class, where we see that Haddonfield High has not changed their curriculum in 40 years. Fate took a different course. Fate caught up with several lives here. There's nothing to learn. And just like Lori, she looks outside to someone impossibly seeing her. But lucky for her, it's not somebody who wants to kill her. Lori gives Allison $3,000, and then Allison tells her to get over it. Get over it. So she goes to do just that. But instead of going to talk to him, she plans on murdering him during the transfer. I'm the one that needs to kill it. Lori shows up to the turd meeting dinner with whiskey breath and causes a scene. Her mom tells Allison that she's happy Lori went cuckoo because now she knows what kind of crap she had to put up with as a kid because watching your grandma cry in public is exactly like learning how to fight and shoot. And you clean their guns and you got children and you clean guns and you like to get high with them and then y'all get fat. Outside of town, we see a guy and his son going hunting in the middle of the night, but run into the bus from Smith's Grove, and all the patients are grazing like cattle. They both get out of the truck, but at least the kid is smart enough to bring the gun, which he uses to shoot the doctor. Ah! Oh! He then goes back to the truck, and he dies. I'm missing dance class for this. Frank Hawkins shows up and finds the dead dad and the doctor. At the hospital, Frank tells a cowboy that Michael escaped, and they need to find him. We have one order of business. That's to hunt this thing down. The next day on Halloween, the podcasters go to the grave of Judith Myers, where Michael also happens to be. We can only assume he was going to steal this tombstone again, but then he bumped into the people who have his mask, so he spies on him. He was watching you as we arrived. The cemetery caretaker doesn't seem to know the story, so they tell her how Judith died. He stabbed his sister in the tits. But I don't really think she gives a shit. So the podcasters pull over at a gas station because the lady needs to take a shit. You need to go to number two almost immediately. And while she's taking one of the most polite shits in history, she gets nervous because she hears somebody rejecting the same stalls that she was disgusted by. Yuck. But then somebody throws some teeth over the door and she gets scared because she's not a dentist. I know, right? The guy goes to pay and sees that the people that work there are dead and in their underwear. See anything you like? He rushes into the bathroom and helps Michael open the stall door. I just want to help in any way I can. Michael then kills her and gets his Captain Kirk mask back. I guess he's nostalgic. You feel it, don't you, Michael? You feel the mask. Lori hears that Michael escaped, so she looks down the basement stairs and then breaks into her daughter's house to give her a gun. But she doesn't want it and kicks her out, not caring that the man who tried to murder her has gotten loose. It's not your job to save her. But we do see that Lori did an excellent job of training her because she immediately knows something is off when she gets home. I've been preparing for this for a long time. Lori then fails to tell anyone else about Michael's escape, not even Allison or the other people victimized by that night, even though she knew they'd all be together celebrating like idiots. He's been wetting the bed at night. Turns out, they get together every year and just be a buzzkill to everyone trying to have fun. 
even if it is a crappy open mic night. I think I'll break off with my girlfriend. But I think Tommy's hoping that after 40 years and enough alcohol, Lindsay might finally see him in a romantic way and forget what a pussy he was as a kid. But he invites Lonnie and Marion to come along too, just so it doesn't look obvious. Then you rip my clothes off, then we rip Lindsay's clothes off. Yeah, I think I got it. That night, Michael casually steals a hammer and kills some random chick for practice, but she does loot drop a knife, so then he goes to kill the neighbor because she was there. You're telling me they're lined up for a slaughterhouse? They could be. But right before killing her, he was disappointed that the neighbors left before he got to their house. You don't have to cry about it, it's not that big a deal. Here's a school dance where Allison answers her phone just so we can see what Vicky's up to. You're dead. Well, she's definitely gonna die. Shut up. You don't know that. She could just be bored babysitting. He kills babysitters. She's babysitting. She's gonna die. Hey, he just killed a bunch of randos that weren't babysitting, so maybe he's got a new thing. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between your stupidity and your ignorance. So the dance is lame, and Allison's boyfriend is kissing another girl. I say, it's not sexy, it's not Halloween. Since she's upset about this, he throws her phone into some pudding. You know, that staple of every high school dance. So now Lori can't call her to warn her, and she just gives up on owning a phone and leaves. Back with Vicky, Dave shows up in a costume, but somehow still wearing a better hat than we saw him last time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, shut up, Dave. And scares her. But for some reason, she's not scared by the tattoo he got for her. Run! Get up strong. I'll fight him off. The kid she's watching says the boogeyman's in the house and offers up Dave as sacrifice. Send Dave first! She checks the room, but not the closet, like an idiot. I checked the whole place. But when he asks her to shut the closet, she can't shut the door because of the giant knife-wielding psycho and ends up dying because she's wearing socks. So fucking bummed. Michael covers her up like a ghost, and Frank finds her. And then Lori shows up and shoots a mirror, so now Frank knows that Michael's in the house. The old girl scout comes through again. He stops his pursuit to check on Dave, and sees that he has an expiration date tattoo. After Lori shoots Michael, Frank's like, oh, that's right, I was chasing a murderer who was fleeing slowly on foot. Go get him! The cowboy shows up at the doctor, and Frank thinks it's a bad idea to have him there. But the cowboy says he knows Michael, a man who hasn't spoken since he was six, better than anyone. And then the doctor admits that he wants to know more about Michael and his motivations. Dr. Loomis was the only one to see him in the wild. When the cops pull up to Allison's house, we see that her mom is one of those punk bitches that start decorating for Christmas as soon as they can. Skip all over the creepy Halloween shit, right? And she's now willing to listen to Lori now that she has the boys in blue behind her paranoia. They try to call Allison again, but her phone's still in the party tapioca. You gonna get that? Or you want me to get it? Then she lives up to her name by blaming the cops for her daughter not answering her phone. Dude, what's your mom's deal? Why would she say that? Apparently, they should magically know that she's walking home with a friend Oscar who tells her not to worry about Cameron because he's a good guy. But he also says that she deserves better in the same conversation. He then assumes that he's something better and makes a move on his best friend's girl. He's gonna die tonight. She doesn't take it well. You are so pathetic. Oscar then gets dead, but not before he screams in a way that would keep Allison from ever dating him. Somebody please help me! Please, please help me! But she does double back and sees him skewered on a fence. And for some reason, Michael can't magically get through this fence like he did in 1978. He disappeared. And when Allison runs for help, she bumps into better hospitality than Lori did. Can you hear me? Oh God! And then Frank and Sartain pick her up. Now, he's supposed to take her straight to Lori's, but since he's still pissed that he accidentally killed Pete and feels responsible for the people Michael killed today, he drives around looking for Michael first. You want to take this civilian to go look for a psychopathic serial killer? And when she sees him, Frank floors it and rams into him as hard as he can. Sartain checks on Michael, and Frank pulls out his gun and is ready to execute the unconscious mental patient that's proven to be very docile once apprehended. Remember, he's property of the state. He mustn't be harmed. Oh yeah? So Sartain defends his helpless patient by stabbing Frank. He's not an asset, he's a liability. He stabbed a cop? Underestimate no one. He then puts on Michael's mask and puts Michael in the back seat with Allison. I wanna know what pleasure he gets out of killing. He wants to take him to Lori so he can watch how he'll react around her. He then runs over Frank, just to make sure he's dead. Oh man! Allison lies to the doctor and says that Michael spoke to her. And when Sartain mentions Judith, Michael wakes up and starts kicking his seat like a toddler. Leave me alone! Michael then drags Sartain out of the car and far enough away so Allison can slip out and run into the woods. I mean, did he really think that he was just going to attack Allison and not him? So, this is what it feels like. So instead of getting to see Michael kill Lori and her family, he gets dead while Allison runs away. I really hate to say I told you so, but... Cameron was walking around calling Oscar, hoping that he's with Allison because he can't call her since he threw her phone in the party tapioca. Well, he looks up at the road and sees Frank. 
So he runs to him and screams for help, but nobody seems to be around. It also seems that he's forgotten about the cell phone he was just using. Too young to give a shit, too drunk to remember. But Frank wakes up and scares the crap out of him and immediately is like, And I'm the one. This is gonna get him. And Cameron's like, Look, buddy, I have no idea what you're talking about, but you and I both know you aren't doing shit. We'll see about that. So after an ambulance shows up, he finally remembers that he has a phone and calls his dad for a ride, who he knows is at a bar. And apparently his dad and all his friends just go to a bar and tell their story so they can get free drinks. Yeah. Hey man, let me, get you, let me buy you guys some rounds. Drink, free shit. What's wrong with you? So they're feeling pretty good about now. I'm like really drunk right now. Some cops show up to see what the commotion down the street is, but they get used as a distraction to get Ray to open the door. You're like a PB&J everyday oh, kind of guy. There we go. I got peanut butter on my penis. That sounds disgusting. I'm not gonna try that. And then Michael sneaks up on Ray and strangles him. I can take care of my own family, all right? Lori tells Karen to go to the basement while she handles Michael. He knocks on the door, but Lori won't let him in. I will murder you and your whole family. Are you fooling around again? I'll kill you if this is a joke. When Lori goes to check on Karen, Michael finds another way in. Lori then shoots the floor, giving away their position in the basement. But Lori goes back up to try to lock him in a bedroom because she has these animal cages on all the doors. I should have guessed. She finally spots a trail of blood leading upstairs to her creepy doll room. And instead of locking the door from the outside, she locks herself in with a murderer. Turns out that the blood trail just leads to Ray. I gotta clean this peanut butter off my hand. And he just stuffed him on a shelf in a closet so he could sneak up on her from behind a mannequin and throw her off a balcony. Allison also stumbles across Lori's outdoor mannequin collection. This is the dumbest shortcut I've ever. And she must have a phobia or something because she screams really loud for someone with a killer out there. Do you ever just shut your goddamn mouth? She then bypasses two dead cops in a car with the lights on and ignores all the broken glass in the doorway just to casually walk into her grandma's house. I'm glad you got to see that. She then yells several times, even after seeing blood. This distracts Michael, and when he looks back, Lori's gone like a fart in the wind. Could have been a skunk. Karen comes up to get Allison, but when Michael comes downstairs to check on the noise, he must have remembered being shot from below because he just beelines for the kitchen island. Karen grabs a gun to protect her daughter, but then says she can't shoot the man that murdered her husband and attacked her child. I'm sorry, I can't do it! But she pulled a sneaky, and it was just part of a plan to get him down to the basement. So my mom's a liar. But he wants to fight back and grabs Karen. Allison also has to stab him to let her mom go, and then they lock him in. It's a trap. They then set the whole house on fire just to make sure he's dead. But he just stands there like, this is fine. Then they hitchhike out of there and freak out when they see a fire truck. Oh no! Oh, let it burn! When these guys got on scene and realized that the cops in the car were both dead, and one's head was used as a jack-o'-lantern, procedure, as well as common sense, dictates that they should have done this. <laughs> Fuck this oh, oh. It. But they don't do that. Instead, they immediately go in, even though they usually don't go inside unless they know someone's in there. This one dude conveniently falls into the basement that Lori purposely made into a death trap you can't escape. But he finds that Michael was hiding in a fireproof gun closet that she made big enough for a person to stand in for some reason. Because that is the law. So Michael kills that firefighter and then goes outside to kill some more. And this all happens while Lori, Karen, and Allison are getting to the hospital. Because Lori needs surgery, you know, from getting stabbed. You're not fine. You had a knife in your fucking stomach. But while she's in surgery, Karen goes off on her own to be sad. But you'd think that she wouldn't want her daughter who was almost killed out of her sight. And you'd think that the daughter would need some consoling after seeing her friend skewered and finding out that her dad is dead. That's weird, right? And we also find out that Annie's dad's a guard at the hospital. And his boss must be a real asshole making him work on the anniversary of his daughter's murder. Compassion's overwhelming, doctor. Back at the bar, everyone's finding out about the murders in town. And even though they know about the gas station murders, the bus crash, and now these murders, they're still not sure if it's Michael. We don't even know if he was on the bus. Tommy, you're so paranoid. I mean, Tommy thought it was him when it was just the gas station murders. But everyone else is like, people get murdered around here all the time. Stop worrying. It's not that guy. But apparently since the news only has his face and hasn't said his name, there's still a chance it's just another psycho killing people in Haddonfield on Halloween. Every breather with the mask was the same man who poisoned Pope John Paul I. The news is even drawing parallels between his last murder spree. They also interview a child with no parents in sight and inform everyone that his babysitter was killed. So I really hope that her parents had the TV off. He stabbed, he, he killed her. So this couple noticed that all the murders took place in homes on their street. So they're like, wow, it is clearly not safe to be out and we should go back to our home 
on that street. But since they're super worried about safety right now, this dude immediately ditches his wife because he's got a bad habit of forgetting his stethoscope. I need it, I'll be right back. And she is so freaked out, she doesn't even notice her windows are fogged up. And even if she did notice, she doesn't check the back seat until she gets in. And of course, there is somebody in the back seat, but I'm really not sure how they got in considering we see her unlock the car. So she runs back and- And Tommy's like, okay, this is your moment, Tommy. Lindsay thought you were a pussy for the last 40 years. It's go time. So knowing that Michael Myers has survived being shot multiple times, he grabs a baseball bat. You can't kill the boogeyman. So a big group gets together and they're all heading out to the parking lot. Like, yeah, let's get him. But then they realize that he might have supernatural powers. So they just kind of back off and let the dude with the baseball bat go on his own. Like, oh, we, we got you back, bro. <laughs> Nobody believes me. And as Tommy approaches the car, the driver needs to find the right radio station so he can drive off. Which of course, nobody anticipated the running car would do that, but it immediately crashes. God sakes, he can't drive a car. Turns out it was the other escape nut job. Are you the psycho or the freak show? Well, everybody else on that bus could have been just as dangerous as Michael. Two of them were checking their emails at a local library. Most of them, minor offenders, mental patients. Just found three of them holding hands, chasing butterflies at a flea market off the 220. So some other cops get to Lori's place and find all the people dead. So they decide that they need to start looking for him, but he's already made it to the neighbors. What the fuck does he want? Who gives a shit? Call the cops! So Michael's in the bathroom that's on their porch, you know, in case the mailman needs to take a shit. But when the old man sees him, he locks him outside on the patio, but Michael just comes through the window. So the cemetery caretaker who just found out about Michael Myers earlier this day is now being attacked by him. But Sandra might be just as paranoid as Lori because she has way too many locks to open before Michael comes in. So she grabs a knife. Michael's like, ah, I was gonna use that. So he grabs a fluorescent bulb and she just sits there while he comes over and slowly stabs her. He then brings her husband into the kitchen and stabs him with like all the knives. Why would he do that? Well, we know he likes to pose the bodies, but I mean, come on, they all can't be masterpieces. We then see that Lori's dad finally sold Michael's old house to Big John and Little John. And the older and taller one is Little John. So I can only assume that they're referring to penis size. Uh, check. But some kids prank them and they give them a history lesson on Michael. They don't give a shit. They just wanted the candy. I got it! So Frank finally gets to the hospital and the cops question Allison and Karen. But these ace detectives don't take their clothes as evidence and just let Karen walk around in that stupid Christmas sweater. My suggestion is termination. Karen then blames her mother for her husband's death and for her and Allison being in danger. She put us in his path. Conveniently forgetting that Lori devoted her whole entire life to trying to protect her from this exact danger. It took priority over your family. But Allison is telling them that her dad's death is the doctor's fault and Michael doesn't give a crap about Lori. Oh, Lori. Scared another one away. They're also told that Michael's still alive and Karen tells the cops to stop looking for the murderer because she is 100% dead ass sure he is just gonna show up to the hospital to kill Lori. He is stalking her. At the same time, Cameron finds Allison and invites her to go on a boogeyman hunting date. And she's all, that is the most romantic thing anyone has ever done. Instead of saying, shot him in the face, burned him alive. And he's still alive, but you have guns. I'm sure we'll get him this time. Karen comes over and Cameron tells her that her daughter's gonna join the angry mob. It'll be fun. And she says, no, you can't go hunt a person with your boyfriend. Now, please just go sit next to your grandmother, who is definitely 100% the person he wants to murder tonight. So Allison goes into Lori's room, but only to give her the knife she stabbed Michael with earlier. And then she meets up with Cameron and all these other people who have been drinking all night. So Oscar got you fucked up? No, I got, I mean, I got me fucked up. But Karen's too busy being a her to notice that she's missing until she finds a card that Allison had the time to write before running off to possibly get herself killed and give her mother one more freaking thing to worry about on the worst day of her life. Don't worry about your mom. She will freak. But she'll get over it. Tommy and Lonnie decide to form an angry mob because Michael Myers has haunted this town for 40 years. But he really just killed three people that night and got arrested. So you can't have it both ways. Either this town was forever changed. This was a safe place and now it's not anymore. Or it's a vague story people know about. Any of you know the story of the Haddonfield Boogeyman? I, I heard about that. You ever hear of Michael fucking Myers? 
But because they were scared that night, they pressured the whole town to get involved. And I guess everyone's using the hospital as a recruiting ground because everyone just starts showing up for no apparent reason. The couple from earlier are actually medical professionals. I'm a doctor, my husband's a nurse. And they think that the best way for them to help is to go out hunting instead of, you know, helping the injured people inside. Never fired a gun before. But it might be because he doesn't want to see his creepy boss. I thought it was going to be like a holiday pizza party with a bunch of coworkers, not an orgy. With the punch, got the madness in the face. And because the small army that's in the hospital parking lot wasn't enough, Tommy goes out recruiting for more people. Now listen boys, there's strength in numbers. While Lonnie and the kids just drive around telling people to go back inside. Tommy's trying really hard to seem tough, but... Man, I had an altercation with Mars about an hour ago, but he escaped. And he doesn't bother to mention that Michael was able to kill a whole crew of firemen all at once, because I'm sure this mob of randos who hang out at a Midwest gas station are in peak physical condition. I think maybe this is a little bit too much for you. And even though he had access to firearms, he stole the bartender's grandfather's baseball bat that had a place of honor in the bar. Classic. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Nice. That's so fun. <laughs> Marion complains that no one took Dr. Luma seriously as if he did everything possible to warn people. I told everybody! But I seem to remember him convincing Sheriff Brackett not to warn anyone. Just tell your men to keep their mouths shut and their eyes open. Lindsay, Marion, and the couple see some kids on a playground, so Lindsay goes out alone to tell them to go home. And it's the same little shits that pulled a prank on the Johns, but one of them is missing. And they don't believe Lindsay because the Johns scared him earlier. They've actually been seeing Michael for a while, but thought it was totally okay for their friend to go off on their own. <laughs> But then they see him again, sitting really far away next to Lindsay's car. Is that Dennis's mask? So obviously everybody inside the car is doing a very good job of keeping an eye out. And that's when the kids finally understand that they're actually in danger, drop everything, and run away. I'm honestly surprised that they're even still out, considering that Lori pulled a gun on him earlier. Would you say that Lori Strode has lost her fucking marbles? But Marion eventually notices, and I guess Michael recognizes her, because he pulls the same moves on her that he did 40 years ago. Marion shoots at absolutely nothing Thing, but manages to break windows, making it easier for Michael to grab them. And the couple just wants to run, but can't. And while this is happening, Lindsay collects all the loose bricks from the playground, because you know, those are always just laying around. When Marion has Michael dead to rights, she doesn't realize that she ran out of bullets stupidly shooting the windows. So once Michael stabbed Marion enough times that you know she's dead, this dude finally remembers he has a stethoscope, but that doesn't work out too well. And after they're both dead, his wife comes back with a gun, but Michael doesn't seem too worried about that. Give me, give me. I shot this shit before. So Lindsay comes up and hits him with the bag of bricks, but he just starts strangling her. Little Lindsay Wallace won't know what hit her. But she gets away and knows all she has to do is run and not fall down. And for once, someone can successfully hide. I'm not playing no hide and seek. It's stupid. Michael's like, that's why I like killing people in houses. They always forget how to open doors. Oh. So Lonnie, Allison, and Cameron get to Lindsay's car at the same time as Tommy. They immediately start yelling for the one person still alive. Lindsay! Lindsay! And I guess they realize they aren't supposed to know she's dead yet, so they start yelling for Marion too. Marion! Marion! And just like us, they didn't bother to learn the couple's names. And you don't even know her name, do you? They find their bodies, but not Dennis's. Maybe he didn't have enough mass, so he just threw his body in a bush. Could have been a skunk. Could have. Lindsay tells him that she saw his face. <laughs> And they act like this is a big deal. But any of them could have gone to the loony bin and seen him in person for the last 40 years. And Allison already saw it earlier that night in the car. I think he's cute. What she should have said is, if you take his mask off, it distracts him and you can get away. But this is the second time he stopped strangling somebody to fix his mask. If you don't, it's your funeral. So Tommy brings Lindsay to the hospital, where the staff are seriously overwhelmed. We can't handle this scope of crime scene. Too bad three medical professionals just died because they thought they would be more useful hunting the boogeyman than doing their fucking jobs. I can understand why. Lori and Frank are on drugs and flirting. Until Tommy comes in and cock blocks them. Way to kill the mood, Tommy. He then goes and gets all the people at the hospital worked up, thinking that they can kill Michael. And now that Lori knows Michael's still alive, she thinks she can kill him too. So she steals Frank's painkillers and beelines to the hazmat trash, guessing that somebody would have moved the bloody knife wrapped in a bloody shirt to the chair and that Karen would throw it away. Look, I have a plan. Where's Allison? We need to get out of here now. So over this huge crowd, Tommy, Lori, and Karen all hear this guy meekly asking for help. 
They also hear a few people murmur that they think it's Michael. Now considering that he's talking, and by all accounts has not uttered a word. That should be your first big clue, it's not him. Then you have the fact that he's not towering above everyone and murdering them. But none of that stops him from chasing this little hobbit of a man throughout the hospital. Lori and Karen actually get a good look at him, realize it's 100% not him, and for some stupid reason, don't use the intercom at the nurse's station right next to them to let everybody know. That was a mistake. Karen ends up locking this guy in a hallway where nobody can get to him, but because he doesn't want the crowd to get him, he just goes ahead and jumps out the window. Or maybe somebody just didn't have their shoelaces tied. Mr. Tavoli here has a fixation for such things. And even after seeing this dude, Tommy still thinks it could be Michael. So while the town was out killing fake Michael, real Michael went home. He came home. He knocks on the back door, but little John takes too long to answer, so he runs around to the front. Why do they do it? Goddamn kids. But then he sprints to the back again Again, sneaks in. Someone's in our house, and it's not a child. Big John is taking this very seriously, and strips down to his underwear for a fight. He even puts down his weapon that would give him some distance between his attacker, picks up a knife that's used to cut soft cheeses. Oh, I'm so scared. But see, these guys actually watch cop shows because they do a better job of clearing this house than the cops did before. But apparently not good enough because Michael gets Big John. And Little John could have escaped, but he goes and ruins Michael staring out the window. He's sensitive. So Lonnie figures out that that's where he's going, but instead of calling everyone, they decide to just go by themselves. Well, why haven't they run into any of the other people that are supposed to be looking for Michael? Um, because everybody else is at the hospital. But Tommy's convinced Karen, pretty much by being wrong about everything, that she needs to come out and hunt with them. So he can't hurt anyone ever again. Well, someone's getting into the spirit of things. So when they get there, Lonnie finally realizes that taking your kid to find a serial killer is not good father-son bonding time. So he goes in alone. I'm not afraid. Fool. And now that he's sure a crazy psycho killer is in there, he finally gets the courage to go inside. Idiot. He's gonna get you. He's gonna get you, Lonnie. He's gonna get you. The kids don't want him to go alone, but they don't bother to say, hey, why don't we call and wait for the other people Tommy recruited? Don't get murdered, Lonnie. <laughs> but then they hear a shot. Get away from me. Leave me alone. And immediately go inside. And surprisingly, these kids do a better job of clearing the house than the cops did too. They find the Johns. I'm sorry, but it's really hard for me to believe that Michael went through their record collection to stage this. Because this was not playing earlier. And Allison forgets about Cameron's dad because she wants the knife instead of the gun. But Cameron does remember his dad and goes off alone. He finds him. Dude, you okay? But before he can figure out how Michael got him up there, he's attacked. But then Allison remembers the whole let's stay together thing right before Cameron gets stabbed. And it's a good thing she grabbed the knife because he gets the gun away from her like really easy. But then she stabs him and is like, so how do you like it? Which of course he doesn't. So he throws her down the stairs and breaks her leg. So Cameron takes the time that the psycho is distracted to take out the knife and bleed more instead of, you know, shooting him. And it doesn't work out too well for him. But now that they're both injured, Michael gets to play a little. And Allison is all, but Michael's like, you need to wait your turn. Kids are so impatient these days. He then starts down the stairs, even slower than usual, because there's no rush, her leg's broken. So he just kills Cameron. Damn it! See, he had to stop and kill Cameron to give Karen enough time to save Allison, which she does, and she's the only one to single-handedly knock Michael Myers flat on his ass. So apparently all those years of training are actually paying off, but this badassery is completely ruined by her stupid fucking Christmas sweater. Do not talk no shit about that woman. She will fuck you up. But when he's down, she doesn't go to her daughter to check on her. Instead, she takes his mask, figuring he'll just get back up. Come and get it! Didn't she leave with Tommy? The only way to catch him is to play by his own game. Tommy Dog gonna fuck him up! So she's like luring him outside with the mask, and he's totally taking the bait. She takes him a whole block away where the angry mob's waiting. The element of surprise. So he thinks you're going one place, then you pop up someplace else. And everybody finally has the idea, let's all attack at once. But they are nice enough to let him put his mask back on. It's Halloween. Everyone's wearing a mask. And apparently these people just showed up with whatever weapon they could find. It's like Tommy sent out a text, grab the item immediately to your left and meet at Oak Street. But if this really happened in the Midwest, at least a tenth of these people would have their AR-15. And another 50% of these people would have borrowed the other 10%'s backup AR-15s. Do you have a permit for all these? Some of them. And it would have been an absolute bloodbath of them shooting each other on accident. Just because your intentions are good, doesn't mean things always work out. So this one guy, after having his gun arm severely slashed open, still has the strength to pull the trigger multiple times. But I guess they decided as a rule that once he's down, they can only hit him instead of stabbing or shooting him. 
and Michael looks really weak, so Karen takes his knife and stabs him in the back. And Tommy's like, whoa, that is a low blow. Totally against the rules. So she goes back to check on Allison, and the cops and ambulances are there. There are authorities who are trained. But none of these people care what's happening a block over. And that's because they're going to let old Sheriff Brackett get the kill. When they arrested Michael that night, I was telling my wife that my daughter was killed, so I wasn't there to put a bullet in his brain like we should have. But it turns out, all Karen did was give Michael his knife back. Oh, you didn't. Please tell me you didn't. And he kills the group of randos, and they die. So now it's Tommy's turn to fight. That's the little asshole kid from across the street. And his plan of attack goes completely backwards. He'll rip his mask off, look him in the eye, swing on Huckleberry here. It's a night night. Well, even though it's a crime scene, Karen goes up to his window, and Michael comes up behind her and stabs her for taking his spot, and disrespecting his favorite holiday with her stupid frickin' Christmas sweater. It's your own fault, and I don't feel a bit sorry for you. And then nobody sees him up in the window. Lori's about to go beast mode. I'll be sorry. So it's one year later. Hold on. Where did he even get out of the house? I don't know. So it's one year later. All the cops and paramedics were there. I don't know. But like I said, it's one year later, and with Michael still on the loose, the residents of Haddonfield are sending their kids out unsupervised to trick or treat. Michael Myers kills babysitters, not kids. That's not true. Is that Dennis's mask? I'm missing dance class for this. What are we gonna do? Castle Halloween? But the Allens actually give a crap about their kid, so they hire a 21 year old with pedo glasses to watch theirs. We're gonna have a good time tonight. That sounds like a threat. A little mm -hmm. fucking pedo creep. That's right. And Jeremy hasn't been sleeping, thinking that Michael might get him, and Corey comforts him. Okay, man, it's gonna get you. But these just might be some helicopter parents, because as soon as they leave, Jeremy turns into a real turd. And I don't really feel like pretending to be best friends with an ugly ass boy babysitter. He's not even afraid of everything like his parents think, and even fakes being attacked by Michael. We can play hide and seek before bed. Your parents are gonna be home soon. Corey goes to investigate and can't find Jeremy. But then the little shit locks him in the attic right before his parents come home. But even though Corey knows the Allens are coming home soon, and that Jeremy was just pulling a prank on him, he freaks the fuck out and desperately tries to escape. Yeah, can you take a joke? But Jeremy's a moron and stands directly in front of the door that Corey is actively kicking, and it hits him, and he goes over the railing, and he dies. Crash landing! Oh! Play no hide and seek. Stupid. We then go three years later, where Lori is writing a book about evil and surviving it. You forgot to talk about all the people that Michael killed that night. Oh, he didn't kill anyone that we know of. He's gone. He's gone from here. The evil is gone. What? He went on an insane killing spree and then just stopped? What, he's not allowed to kill once Halloween's over? The boogeyman can only come out on Halloween night, right? Right. Well, if you take away Judith, the only reason that he kills on Halloween is because the stupid people at Smith's Grove keep transferring him on that day. Same time, same place. Anyway, the book Lori's writing is about Michael, and the way some people are still blaming other murders on him. You think he's come back? Michael doesn't use guns. <laughs> and how some people can't move on. It's a little part of me for you. Lori talks about how since Michael isn't around to be the town's boogeyman, that they created others, like Corey. Are you telling me that the end of the Halloween story isn't gonna have Michael Myers in it? Michael's around someplace. No, he's in it. I mean, sometimes. You can't close your eyes and pretend he isn't there, because he is. But back on Lori. She's bought a house in town with Allison and is decorating for Halloween. She what? The woman who built a mini fort in the woods because she was afraid a man in a maximum security nut house would escape now lives in town and is decorating for the holiday that all of her friends and family were murdered on with the killer still on the loose. Shut up. She says she doesn't want to live in fear anymore. She's even baking a pumpkin pie for Allison because it's tradition. Well, it's a tradition, not one of hers, since she's probably used to being on high alert and jumping in shadows all week. But it's what's normal to do on Halloween, and she's gonna do it. But it's also the anniversaries of everybody's deaths. Why would they celebrate that? That's bullshit. Yeah. Hey, Allison's cool with all this too. We're both fucked up. She was even thinking about going to a Halloween party, but since she doesn't have a date, she's gonna skip it. And that's how we go back to Corey. He's working at an auto repair shop because apparently engineering schools won't take you if you're suspected of murdering a child. Fuck college. But his boss gives him shit about being late and gives him an old shitty motorcycle, hoping that he can get there on time. Cheap piece of shit. After work, he goes to a gas station where a gang of teenagers try to intimidate him. We're in the fucking marching van. <laughs> 
<laughs> they need him to buy beer for him because their fake ID got confiscated, probably because they were trying to buy alcohol while wearing their school uniforms. And do you know why? Because teenagers are stupid. Exactly. They want Corey to get up for him, and when he says no, they start teasing him about being a murderer. But this makes Corey mad, and he squeezes his bottle too hard, and one of the band geeks pushes him onto the glass because he got chocolate milk on his romper. It's expensive, idiot. And his mom must scotch guard the crap out of his clothes because nothing's on it a few seconds later. But Lori scares him off. All right, you meatheads, joke's over. And after they slash their tires, she takes him to the ER where Allison works. And as soon as Corey walks in, bleeding from getting beat up by some band geeks, she takes one look at his pedo glasses and is like, hubba hubba, who is that? He is so sexy, it's a little too much to take. After she stitches him up, he waits around until she gets off work to take a look at her car that he can't even fix. And because of this, she asks him out, and he tells her no. No. Oh, no, no thank you. But after her grandma tells her that she needs to find someone who makes her feel alive, she texts Corey, who gets punished by his mommy for using his phone at the dinner table. He's grown. He can do what he wants. We also see that his boss, who is giving him shit about being late all the time, is also his uncle, who he lives with, and says not to tell his mom about the motorcycle. Why not? Well, he said that he hurt his hand at work because it's better than saying children kicked his ass, but now she wants him to work at a call center where he can't get any more boo-boos. I can understand why. The next day, Allison brings her car into the shop where she pretends that she wants to get her car fixed, but she really wants Corey pressed up against her. Who knows why? He's handsome. But she's not the only one in the family getting their flirt on. Lori bumps into Frank at the grocery store, and they talk very awkwardly at each other. I don't know. <laughs> uh... All right, so in the last story, Frank wanted to track Michael down. So he's the one that's going to go get him. He needs to die. And I'm the one that's going to get him. Nope. He also joined the Who Gives a Shit Club. Jesus, Frank. He's retired, and now concentrating on his hobbies. I got myself a guitar at the pawn shop. But as she leaves, Lori's confronted by the lady, whose sister is the lady with the bathroom on her porch, who survived Michael's light bulb attack, proving that neck stabs don't mean shit in this franchise. It is true, it's a relevant factor. But the sister blames Lori for provoking Michael and getting her brother-in-law killed and her sister stabbed. And then Frank comes out and all he has to do is explain that he was there too and it was all Sartain's fault, but no. He just wants to comfort Lori. Have you ever really liked a girl and you just couldn't have her? That night, Allison takes Corey to Lindsay's Halloween party, which is really just costume night at a bar. And it seems now that Buzzkill Tommy is dead, people are actually having a good time. Oh, it's just so nice that these people are having such a wonderful time on the anniversary of their family and friends' deaths while the killer is still on the loose. I mean, what, a couple people getting killed by one guy with a knife is not that big of a deal. That is a very big deal. Will you get over that? We're gonna get to him. So Lindsay's in the Who Gives a Shit Club too? Yeah, and for some reason, she's really into tarot cards. And she also might have spiked Corey's drink because he starts dancing on the floor, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Never, ever, ever lay on the floor of a bar. And that goes for the fancy chain ones, but this is a piece of shit dive bar in a small nothing town. I guarantee that thing has not been professionally cleaned in decades gets drunk and gets belligerent and looks like an idiot. So Corey goes to get another drink and runs into Jeremy's mom, and she is not happy to see him. Corey, you're a lifesaver. He's a good guy. So he leaves, and Allison follows, but he breaks things off with her, and she just stands there like, please, sir, may I have some more? I mean, you just, you, you can't walk okay. all over town breaking okay. hearts, hey, all right? Sense? But the band geeks recognize Corey from behind, in the dark, while they're driving, and pull over to harass him again. I hate a guy with a car and no sense of humor. But this time, they break his glasses and throw him off a bridge. He fell. And as he lays there unconscious, he gets pulled into the sewer by Michael. Finally, Michael's gonna kill someone. Unfortunately not. See, since he can't defend himself, Michael lets him sleep it off. And when he wakes up and tries to leave, Michael chokes him from inside a wall that Corey was walking way too close to for no reason. And just as you think the story is going to get good and Corey's going to die, their eyes meet, and you think for just a second that they might kiss. I was hoping for more. But then Michael lets him go, and Corey escapes with his life, and then stupidly goes back to the entrance to look to see if he's following him. Why did he let him live? Well, apparently when he looked in Corey's eyes, he saw all the crap that he's gone through and thought that killing him might actually be doing him a favor. So he let him live as punishment. 
But suddenly, a homeless guy pulls a knife on Corey and wants him to go back into the sewer and get Michael's mask for him. So they wrestle, and Corey kills the dude. I look like an idiot for vouching for him. He then leaves the murder weapon with his prints on it there for anyone to find. I guess he's hoping Michael will clean that up for him. He then goes home, gets cleaned up, and goes to Allison's house to apologize. But Lori looks out the window and sees him standing on the edge of the property, and she's like, oh my god, Michael used to stand behind bushes just like that. There's gotta be something wrong with that guy. Did Michael switch bodies with him and now he's gonna kill everyone? No. She then goes outside to talk to him, but he's not by the bush anymore and pops up behind her because we all know the way to win a woman back is by giving her grandmother a heart attack. I thought you outgrew superstition. But I'm not sure how he snuck up on her when there's nothing to hide behind. And she would have easily seen him over there when she came down the steps. But since the heart attack didn't work, he asks Allison to go on a walk, where his big apology opening line is, I killed someone. And she's like, okay. It's not a big deal. They then break into the house where he killed Jeremy. And while they're doing that, Lori goes to see Corey's mom, and she says that she blames her for Corey being treated like crap after he was suspected for being a child murderer. You're just a little pet Look at So yet again, she just stands there and takes somebody's abuse and then leaves crying. I thought that she wasn't going to let Michael run her life anymore, so why is she letting these people talk to her like that? You pretend like you moved on, but it's bullshit. Later that night, Corey and Allison are at a diner talking about getting out of town to escape their past, where her ex-boyfriend comes over to the table a little drunk and starts asking her to hang out with him, and then starts talking shit about Corey, so he gets up in his face. He goes back to his friends, but he doesn't give up the fight. You know, fuck with the lady! He follows him and waits until Corey drops Allison off and turns down sex to make his move. This isn't a man. But Corey knows that he's following him and heads back under the bridge. He starts his attack by letting the cop find the homeless guy he murdered and then he jumps in from behind. Corey then runs into the sewer and Doug follows. And it's a good thing that he didn't bring his gun with him because Corey's just standing there using himself as bait so Michael can get Doug. Michael cuts his throat, but since neck wounds don't do anything and he isn't up to full strength, Corey has to jump in and hold Doug down while Michael stabs him. That pretty much puts a nail in the coffin with that police officer you were dating. And after a few blows, Michael gets a little stronger and maybe even gets off a little. That's what you get when you fuck with the Mulaney's. Well, Corey wants to get off too, so he goes back to Allison's and is like, hey, rolling around in the sewer didn't take as long as I expected. Is sex still on the table? You have shit on your back. And because he got beat up again, you bet your ass it is. You are so getting dry fucked tonight. He wakes up in the morning to find his mask from the costume party on her dresser. So he takes it, and that night, he goes out hunting with Michael. Are you telling me that Michael Myers has an apprentice? Yeah, he finally met somebody who would help him kill. Well, what about Dr. Sartain? Why didn't he want to go on a killing spree with him? How do you know he didn't? He let him live on the bus. Maybe Sartain helped him escape. I mean, he was willing to kill Frank. But maybe he had to die for the cardinal sin of putting on his mask. Nobody knows Myers better than he does. But anyway, now he knows that Allison's boss is a dick. Hell, we knew that from the couple in the last story. He would have punched Dr. Mathis in the face. But this chick Deb got a promotion over Allison because she flirts with the old pervert. And tonight, he brought her back to his place to finally celebrate her getting the job. He's watching it. It's probably all he can do. It works, just kind of shitty. But Corey wants to make them pay for screwing her over and kills the doctor. I just get so excited about all that boogeyman bullshit. And we see that he still needs some serious training because he looks like a monkey holding a tool for the first time when he can't get to Deb. But Michael comes in and takes care of her with one of his super famous long knives that hold a bunch of weight. But we do see that him killing the doctor somehow healed his hand. And like after all his other murders, Corey goes to see Allison and they have a romantic talk about him killing a child again on top of the roof of the local radio station. So him killing people has improved his vision but his hand's now reinfected, and I'm guessing it's always gonna be that way from him laying on that goddamn bar floor. It just sounds disgusting. He says that he wants to get away from anyone who knows him, but he doesn't want to go alone. And after the local DJ gives them both shit about their past, she agrees to go with him. Now, Corey's mom isn't very supportive of the idea, but Ronald is. I hope you find love. It's nice to know somebody's out there looking out for him. It's now Halloween, and Corey wakes up in the Allen house on the spot where Jeremy landed. Crash land! Oh! You suck at babysitting. But he only woke up because Lori is there to tell him to leave Allison alone. You brought me in! You invited me! And he's like, if I can't have her, no one can. Does that mean he's gonna kill her? Well, at this point, I think she's a little too whipped to turn him down. Hold on. Penis whipped? That doesn't sound right. Cockstruck? Dignitized. 
she's too dignitized to turn him down. He then calls her and says, let's go tonight because your grandma wants to kill me. And Allison immediately believes the guy that she's known for about three days. So they fight when Allison goes to pack. Allison then blames Lori for her family and friends' deaths, but I'm going to have to call bullshit on that. See, Lori tried to prep Karen to fight Michael for her whole life and warned everyone that he would escape. Then when he did, she immediately tried to get them together so she could protect him, but Karen and Ray wouldn't listen. I can take care of my own family, all right? Then Allison ignored her call, which if she took, would have warned her friend, so she would have taken Julian seriously, or at least locked the doors. Do I have to? Then Oscar wouldn't have been walking her home, so he wouldn't have gotten skewered. He just needs to sleep it off. And she would have went to Lori's with her parents, so Ray wouldn't have left the house. Any word? Then, if she'd listened to her mother, Karen would have never left the hospital that night and would still be alive. I really hate to say I told you so, but... But if you go back even further than that, Lori would have never been in danger if, if Michael hadn't seen her that day, so it's really her dad's fault for being so fucking lazy that he couldn't be bothered to meet potential buyers, or at least put the key under the mat himself. You're the one that's capable of fucking hook! And since they plan on leaving tonight, he's got some loose ends to tie up, so he goes back to the sewer and beats up Michael and takes his mask. You expect me to believe that the guy who got beat up by band geeks kicked Michael Myers' ass? Shut up. Corey's killed more people in this story, so he has more evil death mojo or some crap. Michael was in the loony bin for 40 years without getting weak. Why all of a sudden is he a giant pussy after four years? Actually, he's been killing since then. There's even a billboard from last Halloween for a missing girl right next to the bridge. Anyway, just accept that Corey won and now has the mask. If you say so. So he goes and finds the band geeks and taunts them into following him to the garage. He teased the man with brain damage and then he snapped. They decide that they're going to chain his bike to their car and drag it until there's nothing left. But when they tell Billy, the mullet band geek, to start the car, they find him stabbed in the eye. Corey then starts up the tow truck and chases the girls down. And neither one of them are smart enough to hide behind one of the hundreds of cars, instead just staying on the path so the truck can run them over. I know, right? Now Stacy makes it over the fence, but Margo's hair isn't aerodynamic enough for her to get to the fence fast enough, and Corey runs her over after she makes it to the other side. <laughs> But Stacy forgets that someone had to drive the truck, and she goes to check on her friend, and she dies. It's hot time for now. Unfortunately, Corey's uncle can't watch rated R movies at home, and stayed late to watch some Van Damme action. And even though he's watching this movie all alone after hours, he's still wearing headphones and can't hear all the screaming outside. And when Terry gets to his window and begs for help, he gives the child a gun. And after he tells Terry to stay inside, he tries to free Margot from under the fence, but Corey comes out and Terry tries to shoot him, but hits Ronald and he dies. Your fault is your idea. So Terry tries to get Margot out and Corey easily takes the gun from him and makes him eat fire. See how those little bastards eat that. And now that there's no one left to save Margot, he steps on her head and runs her over again. And then he goes to kill the DJ after he makes a pit stop at home to kill his mom. Well, I know that his mom sucked, but why did he kill the DJ? Well, this one called him ugly, so he wants revenge. It's gonna make you sad, even if you don't think it does. But sadly, this is the only character in the whole story that seems to think that Michael was gonna come back. This boogeyman been sitting in hibernation, but trust me, y'all, he'll be back! So he starts off by killing his secretary, who's just now decorating for the holiday that will be over in three hours. There, I would just put up a Christmas tree instead. And then he breaks the DJ's jaw, and then cuts off his tongue, and he dies. Y'all get the hell up off my property before I fuck y'all up. Lori tries to call Allison to convince her not to leave town, but she doesn't answer, and is already at the diner waiting for him. Since this doesn't work, she decides to go upstairs and eat a bullet. Well, two hours later. But she calls 911 first to report it before she pulls the trigger. <laughs> And now, Corey's genius plan is foiled. See, he told Allison to meet him at the diner so she would be out of the house when he killed Lori. And I guess he figured that she was dignitized enough to wait for him for hours. I'm going home. You can figure your own shit out. Corey comes in and finds out that she pulled a sneaky and just shot a pumpkin. And then she shoots him and he falls to the first floor. But when she goes down there, she empties the gun and tells him to kill her. So he picks up the knife, but here's Allison pull up because he never fixed her car. And he's like, if I can't have her, no one can and he stabs himself in the neck. What are you trying to kill yourself? Well, but if he's dead, then anybody can have her. This is true, except his plan was to make it look like Lori killed him to make sure that she couldn't have her either. Only problem is, is that she had a gun and he was dressed like Michael Myers on Halloween, 
So why would she need to stab him? But Allison comes in and immediately believes this bullshit setup. Idiot. Well, to be fair, she believes it because Lori stupidly pulled out the knife and was holding it over his twitching body when Allison walked in. Guys think I'm too smart. But Allison comes in and sees this and is like, Grandmother, what have you done? So you did that on purpose. What? He and when she goes to Corey, he's still alive because again, neck wounds don't kill you. He's still alive. So you'd think with her being a nurse, she'd try to save his life. But instead of trying to plug the wound or be there while he bleeds out, she just leaves. Then Lori notices that the back door is open and we see Michael pick up his mask. And when he goes to get his knife, Corey grabs him. So Michael breaks his neck and he dies. I'm not interested in immortality. Lori hears this commotion and locks Michael in the house. Allison gets a call from Frank asking if Lori's okay because she called in a suicide, so she heads back to the house. Did he really send her to find the body of the one family member she had left? Yep. It'll be fun. It seems that Lori is luring Michael into the kitchen by reheating some leftovers and is able to attack him with a fire extinguisher when they explode. So now it's the showdown we've all been waiting for. A pie-baking, sweater-knitting grandmother who's moved on versus a handicapped geriatric with a kindergarten education that never gave a shit about her. But since they're in the same house, they're like, eh, might as well. You know what? Let's go. It seems that Michael has the upper hand for a while and even blocks her trusty knitting needle attack and reverses it on her. But she knows to go for the mask, and when he's trying to put it back on, she stabs him in the hand. She then pushes him on the island, where she stabs him and then knife nails him to the butcher block. She also pulls down the refrigerator to trap his leg. I'll barely be able to sit up. That's the idea. She grabs the biggest knife she has and stabs him in the armpit, and then takes off his mask and cuts his neck. Uh-oh. Neck stabs don't work. No, they don't. And since the only pain he feels is when Corey beats him up, he rips his hand right out of the knife and strangles her. And she might be kind of into it. Do it. But Allison ruins her kink and rushes in to break the hold and Michael's arm. She then cuts his wrist and he dies. The cops finally show up. Where have you guys been? I called for backup 10 minutes ago. And let Frank in first because the cops will always allow a concerned citizen onto a crime scene before they clear it. What's about time? The cops then allow the two women to take Michael's body and tie it to the roof of Allison's car and drive it through town with a Code 2 police escort to the junkyard. And apparently they already cleared the bodies from earlier since the cops have to remove a roadblock to not only let Lori and Allison in, but everyone in town who's still awake. How are the cops okay with this? This is no time for prudence. Surprisingly, only one isn't. The rest think this is exactly what the town needs to heal. Now, of course, they might not think that after they allowed this many people to not only witness this, but to also let them body surf Michael up to the edge of a meat grinder for cars so Lori can push him in. Evil dies tonight! That ought to kill him. And if that wasn't bad enough, Lori documents all of this in detail as the final chapter of her book. What, dude? Have some discretion, all right? But considering all this got reported to the news, it seems like nobody gives a shit. And now that all of this stuff is behind him, Allison decides that she's gonna leave town, and Frank finally makes a move on Lori. Fuck me! Sure. Did you hit the like button? What difference does it make? It makes a big difference. That's how YouTube puts this video out in front of more people. That and hitting the subscribe button. Hope he's better at childcare than he is at yard work. No pressure. Yeah, I'll sure give it a shot, little dude. Crash landing! Oh! That's actually pretty disgusting and probably not appropriate for kids. 